right, welcome everybody back to Paleo Talks. This week we have Dr. Edward Davis with us from Oregon. How you doing? I'm doing all right. All right, excellent. And we're going to be talking about today something uh, really different from any of our earlier shows. Actually, our first talk about fish, and <clears throat> Dr. Davis here is an expert in fish. Is that correct? That, that is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lesser known of the one of the saber tooth cats back here in the background. The saber -tooth animal. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a funny story. If you want me to tell the story of how I ended up being uh, uh, going around talking about the giant salmon, but uh, I'm a yes, man. definitely. Uh, Let's get to that in just a second. All right. Yep. And uh, we'll go over to David for just a minute, and he'll remind everybody how the show works. Sure thing. We're going to run it the same format as always. We're going to start in just a minute with our guest introduction and presentation. First section of the program is going to be that, and then towards the end, we're going to open it up to audience Q&A. So we will finish the last section of the program. It's just going to be you asking questions of our guest. Oh, that's my cat. My All cat right. has questions already. So when that time comes, uh, we will remind you in the audience to start asking your questions at which point you can leave them in the comments of the Facebook video, or as always, if you can't leave a comment on Facebook for some reason, head over to the Gray Fossil Site Twitter or Instagram accounts and send us a message there. All right. Thank you, David. David is our science communicator and he has his assistant with him today, his, his cat again. What was, what was your cat adding there? Uh, my cat was very intrigued by fish. Okay, uh, yes, of course. So she's, she's excited to hear about <laughs> Salmon it. Salmon is probably the word, the magic word right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Eat for a while, she got one of these soon. <laughs> well, uh, we also have Dr. Chris Widga again with us today. Hey, Chris. Howdy. And uh, we're coming to you from the Center of Excellence in Paleontology at East Tennessee State University, which oversees the Gray Fossil Site. And Ed was just uh, talking about how we have some similar age sites here and, and in Oregon, so it'd be fun to make some comparisons and and maybe we'll get around to that soon. And uh, I'm Blaine Schubert. And again, we're, we're happy to have everybody out there and, and real happy to have Ed with us. And uh, I'd like to start the program with just sort of how you got into paleontology in the first place and then the road that you took to get where you're at with the job that you have now. And then we'll get to the salmon. That sounds great. Yeah, well, I'm a Jurassic Park kid. I don't know how many Jurassic Park kids you've had on, uh, on your um, uh, talks here, but I got interested in paleontology back in, what was that, uh, 1994, 1993, when Jurassic Park, uh, the movie came out, and I watched that movie, and I thought, I have to either be a special effects artist or a paleontologist, and I was living in Memphis, Tennessee, that's where I grew up, is in Memphis, and there were no places where I could volunteer at a special effects uh, studio, but I could volunteer at the Memphis Pink Palace Museum. So that's what I did as a high school student for four years. I volunteered at the Pink Palace. I got to work on fossils from Coon Creek in uh, McNary County, Tennessee. And uh, that's the basis of my paleontology background. I took that to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville where I earned my degree uh, back in 1999. And I left Tennessee just before the Great Fossil Site was discovered and went to the University of California, Berkeley, where I earned my PhD working with Tony Barnowski in the Museum of Paleontology there on fossil mammal evolution. So a lot of my work is actually on large mammal evolution and thinking about how things like three-toed horses turn into one-toed horses or more often about how pronghorn antelope evolved and how they're different. So we only have the one pronghorn antelope today that has the prong horns on its head. But back in the Miocene, uh, you know, in the time of the great fossil site and earlier, there would have been um, maybe a half a dozen or more different genera of pronghorn antelope. And some of them had spiral horns and some of them had horns that look like water buffalo. It's kind of crazy. So a lot of what the African antelope do today, we had pronghorn antelope doing in North America at that time. So uh, from there, um, uh, I got hired by the University of Oregon first to work in the museum of paleontology and then uh, in the earth sciences department as a professor. So my position here at UO is split between the earth sciences department where I teach uh, classes and the museum of natural and cultural history where I'm in charge of the fossil collection. And we have a lot of fossil mammals here. We have a certain number of fossil fish as well. 
and a lot of fossil invertebrates and fossil plants, uh, mostly from Oregon, but all over the Northwest and even as far east as Coon Creek in Tennessee because I donated some of my personal collection from high school to the museum here. So um, yeah, that's what I do. That's where I came from. And uh, it's kind of an interesting story. I ended up working on the fossil salmon because we have fossil salmon in the museum collection here, giant salmon as you'll see, and uh, I got excited about the specimen because it's crazy big and unusual. And I got my colleague, uh, Brian Sidlowskis, who's at Oregon State, excited about it too. He's a modern fish biologist. And we started working on CT scanning the fossil that we had um, and describing that. And then uh, lo and behold, uh, a friend of mine who's an amateur fossil hunter found out that there were more fossils of the thing eroding from the original site so we went out and collected and we ended up with two more skulls and uh, I'll be talking about that in the talk today too. And so I was able to get some additional fish paleontologists looped into it. Karen Cleason is at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and Sabrina Pes uh, Prescott, who was at Dalhousie University at the time. And, uh, and so in the end, I'm a person who's connecting people who have the knowledge to the specimen, but I don't actually have any of the knowledge myself. I just have access to the specimen and access to the field site. Um, so that's sort of the weird contingent way I ended up being a, a giant fish expert. <laughs> you found something cool in the collections. Yeah, I found something cool in the collections and then I found something cool in the ground and, and now I'm talking to people about it. I mean, it's a really amazing animal. Uh, I just always like to point out that anything that gets right in the talk is uh, somebody else's fault and anything that I get <laughs> wrong in the talk is, is my fault. All right. Well, if you could go ahead and share your screen, we'll, we'll start looking at your presentation. Okay. Do, 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 do. Share screen. And begin. And begin. Is that, is that full screen for you guys? Yes. All right. So I call this talk the fanged fishosaurus talk. That was kind of a joke because uh, we were lamenting the lack of dinosaurs. And just interestingly enough, Oregon has uh, fossil records such that the time of the dinosaurs was mostly uh, underwater. And there, uh, as I'm sure your viewers know, very few dinosaurs that lived in the ocean, uh, actually none. And so <clears throat> there's not a lot of dinosaur fossils in Oregon, but this is really big. So we call it the fanged fishosaurus as a joke. And then this diet, this little picture over here is some uh, paleo art made by my friend Ray Troll, the paleo artist from Alaska, who loves the giant salmon. And um, he made this art for our museum exhibit that opened in 2014, right before we found the new fossil skulls that made it clear that this was wrong. <laughs> and that uh, what we used to call a saber tooth salmon didn't have saber teeth at all. So you'll see that later on in the talk. But uh, I thought it was funny that, that we got this art done, opened the exhibit, and literally two months later, we found the fossil that overturned that idea. And that's how science works, right? We're always trying to find new information that'll uh, change the way we think about the world. So I mentioned before, these are my collaborators who know all the right things that are in this talk. Uh, Brian Sidlowskis is up at Oregon State in Corvallis. That's our friendly interstate rival. Um, and then uh, Karen Cleason is at the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine and Sabrina Prescott uh, um, earned her degree from Dalhousie University. And uh, so they're all the fish uh, paleontologists and biologists who have contributed to my knowledge to be able to communicate this to you today. So this was the original specimen. This is the line drawing from the 1972 paper that published the uh, giant salmon. Um, and when we got it CT scan, we had to put a name into the computer because it was at, a, it was at the Oregon Imaging Centers, which is a you know, medical facility and the computer expected a patient. And so we called it uh, salmon fish. And so the computer's printouts and all of the data had Mr. Fish on there as the um, thing. So that became the nickname for this specimen. And one of the things to notice about it is that in the diagram, the saber tooth, quote unquote, saber tooth is kind of, uh, 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 ghosted in. And that's because in the original specimen, the saber tooth part was actually broken off and not connected when they uh, found it. And so this is actually a hypothesis for how it goes together. And this whole idea of them having saber teeth that point down like a saber tooth cat was really a hypothesis. But uh, people had lost track of that um, because it was in the fine print of the paper and just accepted that's the way the animal looked. And so the, the main science questions that we have, right, um, about this animal is why did it get to be so big? So this is a salmon and its skull is like, you know, this big. 
the whole animal would have been more than two meters long, longer than six feet. You know, I'm, I'm a big guy, but I wouldn't have been able to reach from the head to the tail. That's a lot bigger than any salmon we have today. Why did it get to be so big back in the end of the Miocene? And uh, why did it have these saber teeth? What are those for? Um, we want to know why, how the environment was different at that time, because that might tell us something about why it got to be so big. And, um, uh, and then we want to think about whether or not things from this fossil or other fossils could help us inform policy decisions, thinking about how we move forward as people in shepherding the natural environment. Um, so just to give you a, a good idea of how big this animal would have been, here's another illustration by Ray Troll showing what it would have been like if an angler had tried to catch one of these animals when it was alive. So, you know, a thousand pounds, 10 feet long, um, as opposed to one of the bigger modern salmons, the king salmon. So that type specimen that I was first working on was collected in 1964 from a locality in, uh, in central Oregon in Jefferson County. And uh, uh, Shotwell described that place as uh, what he called the torrential bed. So you can see here a diagram or a photograph of these workers in 1972. And, and there's a bunch of unsorted gravels. So it looks like what happened was there was a series of landslides that buried these salmon in a spawning pool. So there's, there's you know, slow water sediment at the bottom, then the salmon, and then on top of them is a bunch of gravel unsorted. So that's the, still our hypothesis today. And so here you can see 2011, the first time we went back to the site, it's very similar still. Uh, it's on private property and we have permission of landowners to go there. They mine it out for gravel that they use on their ranch to gravel the roads. And so over time, it exposes more of this uh, sandy layer at the bottom and the fissure right at the intersection. Okay, um, so that skull that was originally collected was loaned in 1966 to Miller at the University of Michigan by J. Arnold Shotwell, shown here with uh, bones of Tusco the elephant, which is another story I could tell a different day. And uh, that specimen was published in 1972 in this museum of, uh, our museum bulletin, number 18, we published the specimen in 1972. Um, and then in 1986, we finally got that specimen back. Um, and then in 2010, I was able to work with Brian Sidlowskis and some other folks at the Oregon Imaging Centers to get a CT scan. And here we are, uh, Derek Hurt and Lee Michaels of the Oregon Imaging Center and Nathan Sumner. These are uh, the folks who were in charge of the, um, the scanning machine, getting that scan. And so we were able to get uh, CT scans of it, which helped us to look inside of the specimen and understand more about the interior architecture of the skull. Um, and then it looks like I used to have a link to a thing that's not there anymore. And we'll just go to the next slide. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what I wanna say now is that originally this animal was called Smilodonichthys rastrosus. Smilodonichthys meaning saber-toothed cat fish. Okay, and then rastrosus was the specific epithet, the species part of the name because it has gill rakers. Now, modern salmon have gill rakers too. They're these things that they use to filter feed when they're in the ocean. They can actually filter uh, microorganisms out that they're, that they're eating. Um, but uh, the, this animal has way more of them than it should have given its size. So we think that it was actually filter feeding. And I'll come back to that later. But um, in 1993, Steerly and Smith did an evolutionary analysis, a phylogenetic al analysis, and showed that our Smilodonichthys actually falls inside of the modern genus Oncorhynchus, and it's close to Oncorhynchus nerca, the sockeye salmon, and close to Oncorhynchus gorbusha, the pink salmon. And so as a consequence, by the rules of, of names, that has to be changed to uh, Oncorhynchus. So the current name we have for it is Oncorhynchus rastrosus, and Smilodonychthys gets what we call the parentheses of shame, that put it in that subgenus category, and it's not um, an official name anymore. Okay, so, um, it's more than six and a half feet long. It had these saber teeth. And there's two ways that we could imagine that it would end up with these kind of saber teeth and being that size. One way is natural selection and one way is sexual selection. And so I'll run through those really quickly. Um, natural selection is uh, the basis we think for most of the diversity that we see in the natural world. And uh, a good way to understand it, and the way that Darwin first figured it out in his thinking and how he wrote about it in his book is comparing natural selection to artificial selection that people do. So you can think about like um, dogs are all one species, but have a huge amount of variation that people have selected for by breeding individuals with certain traits over time. And similarly, uh, peppers have a huge amount of diversity that's been selectively bred by um, people uh, over time. 
So what we see is that within any kind of species, there are differences in the individuals. They are not all the same, and that's really heightened in these examples of the, the dogs and the peppers. But even in like squirrels or raccoons, there are differences in individuals. The other point that's important for natural selection to remember is that the babies are like the parents. So, you know, when you have a litter of cats, the kittens look like the parent cats. They're getting their traits from the parents. These are my two kids and they, they hate that I'm still using this picture because this guy's almost 12 and she's 14. But, um, but they look a lot like me. And the reason why is because you inherit, like here he is, he's gonna now be mad at me for using that picture. He doesn't mind. Okay. And then the last point for natural selection is that there's always too many babies in the in the wild. Okay. And so you can imagine that that you've, you've all heard about the runt of the litter dealing with pigs. There's not often enough uh, uh, resources from the mother for every uh, piglet. Um, certainly, there's a huge number of, um, of mice and uh, rats in the litter. And if you think about trees, like an oak tree produces so many millions of acorns over its lifetime with the expectation that only maybe one or two of them will actually grow up to be a new oak tree. So if you have way more babies than can possibly survive, the babies have traits that are like their parents and they vary, and then you get enough time, you actually end up with natural selection. And so that's one of the ways that we could end up with a giant salmon with saber teeth is that there could be forces in nature that are selecting for large size. Um, some interesting examples of natural selection. This is actually an inadvertent artificial selection example in dandelions. So when you have wild grass that's not cut, the dandelions will grow tall so that their dandelion heads can get up above the top of the grass. But if you mow the grass, even though you don't mean to, uh, select the dandelions, what happens is only the dandelions that have really short stems will survive and you'll over time select for in your yard short dandelions whose uh, flower heights are lower than the deck height of your mower. Um, so you can actually see natural selection happening in the context of your own lawn. Um, another example uh, are, um, let's see, I, I skipped over the fungus flowers. Is that actually here? No, I just cut that one out for time. But another example that's really interesting and pertains to the giant salmon are island dwarfs and island giants. So one of the things we see is that when you have a species like uh, elephants or mammoths and they get isolated on islands, they evolve to become smaller over time. And the reason why is that they have to have a minimum size of population to be able to be stable but there's not enough resources on an island to sustain a lot of big mammoths. And so there'll be selection for smaller individuals that can survive on the resources on the island. So you end up multiple times across the world getting tiny little elephants and tiny little mammoths evolving on islands. There's some on the, up the coast of California. This is an example from Crete. There's some in the Arctic Ocean that we see in the fossil record. Unfortunately, no tiny mammoths or elephants today, but we see it often in the fossil record. Um, and similarly, the Channel Island fox also off of California is a miniature fox that has evolved in that context just because there's not enough resources for a full-sized fox to survive well on the islands, but smaller individuals can, and so there's been natural selection for them over time. That's not what I wanted to do. Come on. There we go. Okay. But you also get island gigantism. So if you have small animals that are isolated on islands, they can get to be really big. An example of this is the Flores giant rat shown here compared to a regular sized rat. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but um, if you saw a giant rat, you'd, you'd be convinced of how giant it was. And so, um, like I said, this is how the dwarfism happens. You have to have enough animals in the population for it to survive. Um, bigger individuals use too many resources and they can't survive on the island. So there's a tendency for smaller individuals to survive. And over time, you end up with small elephants that survive well on the island and have a big enough population to be genetically stable. With island gigantism, we think part of it is a release from predators so that the small animal that's being um, preyed upon on the mainland gets to the island. With no predators, then they can get to be larger. There's selection for larger individuals because larger individuals tend to have more babies in the, over their lifetimes. They tend to have more babies in each litter and then they tend to also be able to have more litters. And so there's a selection for larger individuals because they produce more babies. And the ones that produce the most babies are the ones that survive. 
And so when we look at our giant salmon, we can actually see a couple of things happening. One of them is that other kinds of filter feeding animals are really large today. So whale sharks are really big and uh, whales, filter feeding whales are really big. So there's some kinds of uh, economy if you're a filter feeder and being big, the bigger you are, the more efficiently you can process through water to get all of those microorganisms out that you're eating. So we think part of the reason why the giant salmon was big was for filter feeding, but part of it also was that that really well, not exactly a release from predator pressure, but there's a there's selection for larger individuals um, and salmon because the bigger you are as a female salmon, the more eggs you lay. You don't lay bigger eggs, they're the same size. So the giant salmon would have grown from salmon eggs that are the same size as salmon eggs today, but a huge si salmon would have would have laid, you know, a hundred times more eggs than a, than a modern sized salmon would have. And that gives them a strong selective advantage because they just have more offspring. Okay, so we think the filter feeding is part of it. We think that the advantage of having a bigger body to lay more eggs is part of it. And that's really what we think is making them giant is this natural selection process. But when we look at the teeth, we worry about sexual selection because those kinds of teeth are sometimes invoked as a secondary sexual character that might be a consequence of competition uh, or uh, female choice. So I'm going to really quickly go through the ideas of sexual selection. These are also ideas that Darwin first talked about in some of his writings, but have been explored more fully over the uh, last uh, 150, 200 years. And so when we look at sexual selection, what happens is if uh, in most species, there's an asymmetrical investment in reproduction by males and females. So the females end up putting a lot of resources into reproduction and the males put very little, but then they have opportunities maybe to mate with more different females. So the males end up competing for access to females and have a differential success in their reproduction. And that's the hinge that, nat that, our, that sexual selection uh, acts on. And sometimes if the access is limited enough, the end result of sexual selection can be stronger than natural selection and produce males that are suboptimal, like this widower bird from Africa, where the males have these super long tails that actually make them easy prey uh, for predators, but the ladies like the long tails. Okay, so there's two kinds of sexual selection. One is intrasexual selection. Uh, that's more commonly found in mammals, where uh, what's going on is that the males are fighting with one another to create some kind of a structure where they have access to females. Like you've got a lot of these uh, artiodactyls, which are the group that I spend most of my time studying in the fossil record, fighting in different ways. Uh, you know, they might be colliding head on like the sheep do. They might be jousting like you get with some deer. And then the pronghorn antelope are interesting because they actually have races. And so the fastest pronghorns are the ones that get to have access to the females. And that's part of why pronghorn antelope are so fast is that their sexual selection competition has evolved to be a speed competition. Um, and so they're, they're high speed that actually is one of the reasons why hunters like to, to hunt them is because they're so difficult to hunt because of their high speed. That's actually a consequence not of natural selection, but possibly because of sexual selection. I think that's interesting. Uh, other examples people might be familiar with are like elephant seals, where the males are hugely large compared to the females because the males have these huge wrestling matches uh, to be able to get access to the beaches where the females are. Um, my favorite example from birds are the hornbills. Um, because they have these big flat plates on their heads and they're not for show. These animals actually, like bighorn sheep, run head on into one another. And so they'll fly over a body of water and they'll try to ram head to head as hard as they can. And one of the birds uh, will fall into the water and the other one will keep flying and that's the winner. And it's pretty spectacular. Um, and so that's uh, intrasexual selection. There's also intersexual selection where the females are choosing which males they mate with. And, uh, and then what happens is the females have particular attributes that they key on and that's what they choose. Uh, so like with the widow bird, uh, what's going on is that the females have chosen long tails and it's gonna kind of run away so that the tails are longer and longer. And that's really what the females are looking for. And scientists have actually shown that if you take a long tailed widow bird and cut off its tail and glue it onto a short 
shorter tailed widow bird, then all of a sudden the shorter tailed widow bird gets all the mating opportunities and the longer tailed widow bird doesn't. So the women, the female birds are, are clearly uh, focused on that long tail as the attribute they look for. Um, there are other animals like the bower birds that the males produce these really elaborate um, bowers where they're actually going and finding blue objects and putting them together to show off to the females that they have good enough resources that they can provide all of these blue objects. Um, it's essentially showing that they're so healthy that they can waste a bunch of time finding stuff that's not food and isn't useful for them. And so they have really good genes you should make, for them, make with them. That's the argument that scientists make for the uh, widow bird too, is that if you can survive with that hugely long tail, then your genes must be pretty good. So you're a good candidate for um, a, a mating partner. Um, peacocks are another example, right, where the peacocks have these huge plumes that are highly visible and the pea hens are very plain looking. Uh, the pea hens are looking for the most spectacular showy peacocks. Um, again, because if you can survive with this, with this huge set of plumes, then you must have pretty good genes otherwise, because that's a, a major liability as far as avoiding predators and finding resources and stuff. Um, um, my favorite example overall of intersexual selection are the stalk-eyed flies, because the lady stalk-eyed flies just really like wide faces. And, uh, and so these animals have their eyes out on these ends of these really wide stalks, and there's not any uh, like natural selection adaptation for it. It doesn't improve their stereoscopic vision enough over just having the eyes in the places that flies usually do to be uh, important. And again, with experiments, it's shown that the female flies prefer males that have as wide eyes as possible. So if the scientists put prosthetic eyes on to make the eyes even wider, then those males win in the mating competitions. So in the end, we have to ask ourselves, do the saber-toothed salmon show traits that would match with either of these kinds of situations that could attribute those teeth to sexual selection? Um, and when we look at modern salmon, what we see is that male salmon in the ocean look very like archetypally fishy, but when they swim in to do their spawning before they die, they actually completely change their faces and grow this big kipe that they use to fight with the other males for access to the females. And so that's a sexually selected characteristic uh, in the male-male competition and uh, something that we might look for in the saber-toothed salmon if it's analogous to that. And you can see that Ray Troll, among other people, has made this comp comparison between the saber-toothed salmon and the saber-toothed cat and thinking that, that maybe they have something aligned with uh, the way that their teeth are growing and what they're using them for. But what's interesting, and Blaine probably knows this uh, very well, is that saber-toothed cats are probably not sexually selected for their giant teeth. It's probably a natural selection trait. What we see is, well, number one, remember that saber-toothed cats are not tigers, so please don't call them saber-toothed tigers. Um, we find them in the Pleistocene. Uh, there's a big debate about whether they're solitary like modern uh, tigers or they're social like modern lions. And I think the evidence points towards uh, being social, but there's, a, there's good evidence that the teeth are controlled by natural selection. We don't see dimorphism in their teeth. The males and the females both have the long teeth. Um, and we even see that the juveniles have their, um, their, their baby teeth are also canines. So something about that shape is important for whatever they're doing, even when they're juvenile animals. Um, and then we also see multiple convergences through the history of cats, of different cats growing these big uh, canine teeth and having them in both the males and females. So we think, I think a lot of scientists think that saber-toothed cats were doing something ecologically with those teeth. It was not a sexual selection thing, but we don't have any modern analogs. So it's really difficult for us to say exactly what they were doing with those teeth, but it was a role that was important and it evolved multiple times. So when we look at the Smilodon ichthys and look at those teeth, well, do we see something that's more like the saber-toothed cat or do we see something that's more like the stalk-eyed flies or more like the, uh, the um, bighorn sheep? And so uh, originally we only had one skull known to science, but um, we actually have multiple skulls now thanks to a discovery that we made in 2014. Like I said, we found these animals right after we opened the exhibit with all that paleo art by Ray Troll. Mm -hmm. And this is what it looked like when we first found it. If you, um, if you look at this as a paleontologist, you can see that there's the outline of the cross section of a skull right here and maybe some other stuff around and it's actually very interesting. But if you haven't looked at as many fossils 
as maybe I have, then it might not look like a whole lot. Um, so Edward, if we're looking at this deposit. Yeah. Uh, you can see lots of rounded boulders and gravel. Yep. And so this is definitely when they were going up into the rivers. Right, exactly. So what, you, what I think is really uh, telling is that the deposit below it and through where the fish actually is, is all fine grained sediment, like you would expect in a kind of a calmer place in the, in the river where they might be spawning. And then uh, above it are these big cobbles and it's poorly sorted. And you can actually see multiple uh, boluses of these things that are on top of one another. And so it looks to me like there was a disastrous uh, landslide event mm -hmm. that buried all of these animals. And they had either just spawned um, or they were in the process of spawning when they were buried. Yeah. And so what I think is that we ended up with a spawning pool full of giant salmon that got buried very rapidly. This is where the original specimen came from in the 50s. Um, I know anecdotally of two more specimens that were collected by folks locally and that didn't get into science collections. Uh, there's another one that was collected in the 80s that is now in our collection thanks to um, NARG, the North American Research Group, which is a paleo collecting club out of Portland. Um, that specimen's on display at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in Portland right now. And we're gonna put it on display at the Marine Science Center in Charleston uh, starting this, this summer. Um, and then there's the two specimens that we discovered here. So, you know, there's at least uh, one, two, three, four specimens in, in our museum that came from this site, and possibly even two more. Uh, so that suggests to me that this was, this was actually a spawning pool at the time that was buried. Yeah, so great, great question. Um, so here we have, uh, we have dug out. It took us an entire day to dig back the rocks above here to get to the point where we could make a jacket. For the specimen. Um, this is my field crew. This is Selena Robson, who's now a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. Um, this is, uh, um, gosh, now I'm being put on the spot. Um, this is, okay, this is Liz White, who is in the museum and is uh, our museum's uh, exhibits coordinator. And then um, I'm going to have to go on Facebook because, um, you know, when you have to remember somebody's name, when you're on the spot, that's always when you forget it. Um, What's your name again? My name? I don't know my name. Okay, perfect. <laughs> oh, she just posted on Facebook yesterday and I saw it and like, that's I feel, okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad because I should say everybody's names. We'll uh, put it on Facebook. Okay. I can look it up later. I'm so sorry. Okay, anyway, so we, we jacketed the specimen. People are probably familiar with this process of putting the burlap sacks on and uh, consolidating with plaster and uh, we flipped it out. And in the end, it actually broke um, because we uh, my back was injured and uh, those three ladies and I were not uh, stout enough to carry that jacket all the way back to the truck. And so uh, we were dragging it and managed to uh, managed to break it. Um, but we got all the pieces and we kept them uh, safe and uh, ended up getting them uh, prepped. Um, I was going to leave it for top men to work on it, but then I got a top man. His name is uh, Pat Ward. And uh, so he actually prepped it. And on the first day he was prepping, he told me, you got to look at this. Their teeth are sticking out sideways. And sure enough, that's, that's what we found. We had two skulls in the block and their teeth were sticking out sideways. And... Um, and so here, what you can see is that's the first skull that I just showed you with the face on, and this teeth are coming out sideways here. And here's another skull sideways, perpendicular to it, and that's one of its teeth sticking up. And so if it had just been one skull, I would have thought maybe it had gotten smashed by the taphonomic processes. But because we have two skulls and they're actually perpendicular to one another, it suggests that that's the actual way their teeth were. And in fact, when we went back and looked at the original specimen, and fitted the teeth onto it this way instead of the way they had been put on before, they fit better. So um, I feel confident that this is what the animal actually looked like. So they're not saber teeth. We're now calling it the spike tooth salmon and they stick out sideways and not vertically, which changes a lot of ideas about how the animal would have been using them when it was alive. I really like this picture because with the blue plastic behind and the gaping mouth here, it almost looks like the salmon would have looked if it was at the market and you know it was in the ice in the, in the display case. I kind of want to put it on display like that in the exhibit. <laughs> like, 
plastic ice around it or something. But uh, but you can really see there's its mouth. There's this tooth sticking out sideways. Um, hard is large this is. animation because we're running short on time, and we do have a bunch of videos of this on our website. So if you go to the Museum of Natural and Cultural History's um, YouTube channel, you can see some videos that we have about the salmon. So in the end, um, I don't think the saber teeth were a consequence of sexual selection anymore. And the reason why is because with the three skulls, we actually have a good chance of having a female. And in fact, Karen Cleason believes that she can tell the difference in the shape of the rostrum between males and females with them being slightly different shape. And it looks like both the males and the females then have the saber teeth, saber teeth, the spike teeth, which would put it more in the natural selection category like the, um, like the uh, saber tooth cats. So we think it got really big because it was filter feeding in the ocean and then it could also produce more offspring when it was spawning interiorly. Um, and I didn't really have time to get into this, but the oceans were a lot warmer at the time and the Cascade mountain ranges were shorter, the volcanoes weren't as high. There was a lot more water in the uh, rivers of Eastern Oregon for it to swim into and spawn. It would have been able to make it further than such a large animal could make it today even before there were dams. So um, we think that, that warmer oceans with more productivity, so there are more microorganisms to eat, and uh, more water in eastern Oregon meant that the salmon could get to be this big in a way that it can't today. Um, why did it have saber teeth? We're not sure yet, but it looks like both the males and the females had them. I don't have time to get into it, but my colleague Julia Sankey in Southern California has actually looked at these animals uh, from several sites that are on the way to a spawning location. And it looks like they actually grew these teeth as they were moving in from the ocean. So they didn't have them the whole time they were living in the ocean. They grew them kind of like the kite. Um, that suggests to me that they're using these teeth in a way to clear space when they're fighting for locations in the streams. The males fight to get next to the females to spawn, but the females fight with one another to get the best spots to lay their eggs because there are good spots and bad spots in the streams. Um, where the water moves faster, um, you get more oxygen, but if the water moves too fast, then the rocks you put over your eggs get blown away by the water and then things can eat your eggs. So there's a sweet spot for the females and they're fighting for that too. So I think that's what's going on. The different environment, like I said, warmer, higher productivity. And then if we think about the future, we're moving into a world where it's warmer with higher productivity. I'm sure that other people on your presentations have talked about this too, but we're going from the colder earth that we had when human beings evolved to an earth that's actually more like the time of the gray site or when these giant salmon were living five million years ago uh, at the end of the Miocene. And so what we could expect to see is changes in the natural world that make things accommodate those warmer temperatures more like what we saw in those five million year um, old fossil deposits like this one in Oregon or the gray site in Tennessee, right? Um, a lot of people contributed to this work. Like I said at the beginning, anything I got right is, is other people's fault, and anything <laughs> I got wrong today is my fault. So thanks, and I'll happily answer your questions. Thank you. So, so what you're saying is, you know, salmon today, they're, they're sort of struggling for space by doing this, and yeah. therefore it's advantageous if you also add that to it. So that's yeah, it's exactly. really cool. It's like a basketball player with her elbows yeah. out, right? Right. You're just trying to clear space. Yeah. And I mean, um, they have most of their muscles are, are, you know, evolved for that kind of lateral motion. So a modern salmon can hit you pretty hard if you're hauling it in, uh, even the size it is today. But imagine a thousand pound salmon slamming its head sideways into you and it has a spike sticking out sideways. That could probably kill you in a hurry. Yeah. Are, are these spikes, are they like bony spikes or are they actually teeth with they're, enamel? They're actually teeth and have enamel. Yeah. So when you look at the CT cross section, they're, they're real teeth. And what's happening is as the teeth grow, it's hypertrophying, it's growing extra fast, the bone on the palate side and not on the top side. So the teeth actually kind of move out like this. And so you can look at the cross section of the CT and see the texture of the bone that shows that it, that it kind of grew it out like that to get the teeth to stick out sideways. So in some ways, they're more like tusks. See, I told you, we've turned this into a proboscidean <laughs> Yeah, we can turn it into like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> when you think about what mammoths are doing with their tusks, I mean, it's possible that they could also use these to dig out the nests. They call these reds and salmon. 
Um, so the females have to kind of bulldoze this spot in the gravel of the stream bed to lay the eggs. And so if you have these things, it can make it easier. Mm -hmm. to yeah. yeah, you would expect them to get sort of striations on them if that was the case on, on the other side. That's true. Yeah, we haven't done any microware analyses on these yet. That's mm -hmm. not a bad idea. And so what was, there must have been a big terrestrial carnivorin that was out there that was loving to eat these things. Oh yeah, you know, I think it would be great if Ray Troll took it upon himself to draw uh, a bear cat knocking a giant salmon. So there, there are amphicyonids from some of the same time periods, not those particular rocks, but uh, there were definitely these big bear, bear dog animals at the time uh, that could have been, yeah. Yeah, just supersized, you know, just like the Kodiak brown bears get so large because of the massive amounts of salmon that they eat right wow yeah, yeah it'd be like a kaiju battle but with bears and salmon hmm. so what would it have tasted like what would it have tasted like uh, probably it would have tasted like a salmon mm -hmm. so i mean if you do the evolutionary bracketing it falls between the sockeye salmon and the pink salmon and so those both taste like salmon so the expectation is it would have tasted like salmon I love that. Well, one of the ironies for me is that I actually have a fish allergy, so I can't eat fish. That is an irony for sure. Yeah, I know. So like <laughs> we've had we've had big fish fries at the fossil site to celebrate collecting the giant salmon, and I have to go over and eat chicken or something while everybody else is eating fish. Yeah. So salmon still tastes like chicken to you. Yeah, it does. <laughs> David, do we have other questions out there? Chris, do you? David has a few. Yeah, go for it, David. Sure, sure. We've got some questions coming in. So as a reminder, if you haven't, uh, if you've forgotten, you can go ahead and leave your questions in the comments of the Facebook video or head over to the Gray Fossil Site Twitter or Instagram to send us questions there. Uh, Greg asks, do the bones show growth rings? So is it possible to determine how long they lived? And a similar question from Jenny, is it known how quickly these fishes reached their humongous body lengths? Those are great questions. And the answer is actually yes. Um, my colleague Paul Koch is at UC uh, Santa Cruz. Um, early in his career did a isotope study on the vertebrae of these giant salmon. And uh, I don't remember if he was able to get an age by looking at the growth rings, but he was able to show definitely that they had ocean signal and freshwater signal. So you can tell that they are going to the ocean and coming back. Um, it didn't, um, my understanding is that it, it doesn't sound like they grew at a faster rate than modern salmon do. So it would probably be that they would live longer and take longer to get to their full size. Um, but the, that's a question that we haven't directly addressed yet, uh, but it's a good question. How, how long did they take to get that big? Probably they would have taken longer than a modern salmon does uh, to make its to make its life cycle. All right, and uh, you've, we've got another question that you've touched on the answer a couple times. Uh, Greg also asked, is there any indication they were anadromous? Which uh, for anyone out in our audience who doesn't know what that means, that means, you know, going up river to spawn. And it sounds like you've said that you've got some isotope evidence, uh, some of the locations of the fossils, if I yep. understood you correctly before. Yeah, so we have a combination of evidence. The isotopes support the idea that they were anadromous, that is, they um, hatch inland and in freshwater, go out to the salt water and grow, and then come back to the freshwater to spawn again. Yeah, so the isotopes support that, as well as fossil locations. We have uh, fossils from the, from the Bay Area, in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area, that look like they were from the marine stage. We have uh, fossils from Southern California that seem to document animals that were on their way in the spawn. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's probably correct. Um, interestingly enough, uh, uh, Jerry Smith, uh, who's a Michigan uh, and did the Steerling Smith evolutionary uh, tree paper has recently published another paper where they looked at a landlocked population of miniature giant salmon from Idaho. So um, salmon do, I mean, natural selection doesn't care about your rules and it does all kinds of stuff. And so there are modern salmon that don't that don't go back to the ocean and just live in the fresh water, um, often called kokanee. Um, and what we see is that there was a population of giant salmon that stayed inland in Idaho and then shrank down because of a uh, sort of island dwarfism effect of being in the lakes there. So they're definitely this same spike to salmon, but they're like 
small. So it's a miniature giant salmon, kind of like, you know, a dwarf mammoth. It's an oxymoron. Yep. Very cool. Um, we've got, you uh, mentioned isotopes, and I think you said that you mentioned them on vertebrae, but Grant asks, uh, uh, on the topic of isotopes, could the teeth be sampled? Could the teeth be sampled? Uh, and first, I just finally remembered her name, Danielle Oberg. She's at the University of Arkansas working on her PhD now. And I'm sorry, Danielle, the, the, <laughs> I had the Zen moment of completely forgetting your name. Um, um, okay, and so can you sample the teeth for stable isotopes? And the answer is yes, nobody's done that yet, but you should be able to. Since we have evidence that the teeth are growing while they're moving in from the ocean to the inland spawning area, it would suggest that the isotopes that you would get from those teeth would document the environments that they were in while they were making that transition. So it might actually be possible to catch some of the saltwater to freshwater signal. Um, typically, these kinds of animals don't eat a lot while they're doing that uh, spawning trip. So they're feeding and feeding and getting big, and then they just eat themselves. They basically starve all the way until they spawn. And so it's liable that if we did isotopes on the teeth, if they're growing in that context, they would have a lot of information about what's metabolically happening to the animal as it sort of digests its own body. But I don't know if it would tell us as much about um, its ecosystem in the ocean beforehand. All right, uh, we've got, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna comment that Danielle was actually a master's student here at ETSU, so we that's would right. also be in trouble. I, I know, I'm, I'm like doubly <laughs> bad for forgetting the name. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, she was she was at ETSU and, and I'm just a really awful human being, so. <laughs> but, well, if it, if, it makes you feel any, uh, if it makes you feel any worse while you were forgetting uh, her name, she popped up in the comments with a uh, frowny face. Oh no, <laughs> I'm sorry, Danielle. I, I really, like, I'm gonna give myself 40 lashes with a wet noodle. I, I, <laughs> Yeah, no, e40, it's a, e40 it's the, pieces of salmon. You're, when you're speaking in front of an audience, even if it's on the internet, you can have these Zen moments where oh. like really vital information just falls completely out of your head. I never made <laughs> myself notes for those slides because I'm like, I know these people. I'm not going to. <laughs> so. David, another one? Sure, sure. So speaking of their uh, growth and their diet, Jenny asks, if adults had larger gill rakers compared to the smaller modern relatives um, and were filter feeders, were the young ones predators? Were they eating small fish, et cetera? Oh, you know, that's possible. This is one of those places where I'm gonna have to take the Fifth Amendment because I don't know enough about fish to be able to answer this question in a sensible way, but I can hazard a, a supposition. So a lot of animals that transition through really big size class changes like this do have dramatically different ecological roles as they make those transitions. Um, so my understanding is that modern salmon do have a more um, like insectivorous habit as they're making their way from the spawning site to the ocean. Um, so they're feeding on what they can find in the streams as they're making their way. And I would expect these animals to do the same thing too. When we look at modern sockeye salmon, my understanding is that they do some filter feeding but they also do a lot of soft animal feeding too. So they eat things like jellyfish that are soft bodies that they can, um, they can get with their salmon mouths. And so it, the expectation is that as they went through the sockeye size, the, um, the spike tooth salmon might have been doing some of that too. All right, we've got a question from Mason who asks, what was the range of this salmon? Would they have been a fairly common fish or a small part of the ocean and freshwater fauna? Okay, that's a good question too. We have uh, fossils from Southern California and through the Northern California and into Oregon. And there's a possibility that there's some in Washington state as well. I don't know of any records from Alaska or from um, Baja, California, uh, but it's possible. So my current understanding is that they're a Pacific coast fish. Um, uh, there's no evidence of them on the Atlantic coast. There's no evidence of them in the, in the Western Pacific either. So they seem to be uh, west coast of the U.S. Uh, fish. And um, as far as that goes, we find fossils of other salmon in inland deposits at that time, smaller, more conventional, modern sized salmon. Like that's the thing, don't forget that in the fossil record, we don't just have giant things. We also have stuff that's like we have today. 
Um, so I think they would have been an important part of the ecosystem at that time. But like you see with other really big animals, the ecosystem can't support as many big animals as it can small animals. So I think that they would have been, you know, um, rarer than the smaller salmon are. They would have been probably more common than whales because they're smaller than whales, but sort of in that in-between spot. There's actually not any animals in the modern ecosystem that fill that kind of a niche. And that may be because the productivity is lower with the colder oceans that we have today. And so there's not as many resources and that niche is just not open and available for occupation. Blaine, did you say the question? Yeah, so this one is not about fish. Um, very cool work on fish uh, on these salmon. But uh, you said something earlier that really piqued my interest and that was about the pronghorn. Oh yeah. And this aspect of them racing each other. I uh, didn't know that. And I'd always heard, or I remember hearing, and just always sort of thought that this was probably the case, that this was a co-evolution with predators. Right. And so what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, actually, Bob Bacher wrote a paper back in the 70s or the early 80s that was all about this hypothesis that the pronghorn is so fast. For people who don't know, the pronghorn antelope is the fastest land animal in North America. Um, it's faster than any of the predators that are alive today. And so none of the living predators can actually catch it in a straight up race. They would have to trick it. And they're pretty skittish animals. Um, a lot of hunters actually prize the opportunity to hunt pronghorn. Not a hunter, but this is what I've heard from other people because they're uh, fast and they run in a, a zigzag way that can be difficult to traverse if you're, if you're um, hunting them. So um, the animals are, uh, and, and so the question is, why are they so fast? If nothing can actually catch them, then they're faster than they need to be uh, given natural selection. And natural selection doesn't tend to waste resources. Um, and so the argument that Bacher made and that a lot of people have agreed with uh, is that it's the ghost of competition past. That there used to be, we know from the fossil record that there was a cheetah-like cat that lived in North America at that time. And uh, some people um, think that it may be related to, directly related to the modern cheetah. I think there's some evidence that, that persuades me that it's more likely to be convergently evolved to be like a cheetah. And that it's actually from the lineage that the modern puma comes from. Um, but either way, this, this North American cheetah-like cat was very cheetah-like and so presumably would have been a fast pursuit predator like a cheetah and could have then gotten into an evolutionary arms race with the pronghorn. So the pronghorn has to get faster then the cheetah has to get faster, kind of like the cheetahs and the Thompson gazelles are in, in present day Africa. And, and that's possible. And that's possible. And then the argument would be, well, the cheetah went extinct and the pronghorn has this leftover speed that it doesn't need. Um, but you would expect that speed to go away over time if there's not anything reinforcing it and it's still here. And that cheetah has been extinct uh, for at least 10,000 years and possibly longer. And so, uh, and so why is it? Well, um, when you look at modern pronghorn biology, the way that the males compete for females isn't that they line up and joust with their horns that they have on their head. They actually will line up and then have a, a race well, happen is males have territories that they stake out, and the females are in female groups that are free to move between the territories. So it's not like some of these animals where the males maintain harems and they protect their females and stay with the females, but instead the females move wherever they want to and the males maintain territories, and so they fight for the territories that have the best resources because the females spend the most time. And, uh, and so in the end, the males when they do fight over the territories, what happens is they line up and the invading male or the protecting male, one or the other will chase. They'll, they'll do a kind of a display first and that might scare the person off, the other animal off because, well, this guy's very scary. Or if, it's, if the display doesn't scare them off, then they chase. And whoever is faster stays and whoever is slower leaves. And they don't usually actually fight any unless they're both the same speed more or less exactly and then they'll fight while they're running it's pretty crazy and so what's happening then is that there's this reinforcement through sexual selection for high speed so the fastest males get the territories that have the best resources and so they mate the most often with the females so all of the offspring have the genes from the fast males and so it reinforces it 
It's possible that the high speed originally involved because of high speed pursuit predation from this cheetah-like cat, but the sexual selection has captured it and it's maintaining it and it's gonna stick around as long as they still have that behavior, um, even in the absence of predators that can catch them. So as a consequence, the only thing that can catch pronghorn in North America are people with guns, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the explanation. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. I'm gonna definitely talk about that in class. Thank you. You're welcome. Any Very other questions? Cool. We've got one more question from the audience here. Okay. Um, this is from Alex, who, if I remember correctly, is Blaine's brother. Oh, yes. He's a pronghorn hunter. <laughs> oh, cool. He says, uh, but this is about the fish. Uh, Alex's Wyoming. question is, I wonder if there is any evidence of sideways teeth in any other type of anadromous fish. Oh, yeah. And that's a good question. And my fish biology friends tell me no, that they're actually really excited about these sideways teeth because the only other sideways teeth are in things like sawfish, which are kind of shark. And sharks are very deep divergence from bony fish. So, um, so it's not as, you know, it's analogous in that they're going sideways with their saws uh, when, they're, when they're using them, but there's not a lot of uh, connection in the way that they're developing the sideways teeth. So um, there may be some other fish that do have sideways teeth, but no anadromous ones that I know of, that I've heard of. Like I said, I'm not a fish expert, but the people who are fish experts have all been kind of like wowed by the, the thing when right. they yeah. discovered it was sideways. Yeah, Alex is actually a fish biologist, so he was okay. asking means he didn't know either. So yeah. yeah. Well, that's this is my understanding, but like I said, I'm I'm not an expert. Um, I only I listen to experts. All right. All right. Well, thanks to everybody in the audience for asking yep. their those you know, questions. I'm sorry again, I, I got really feel bad. <laughs> no we worries, no worries. Her, we went to buy her a beer or a donut or something. <laughs> All right. Any anything else, David? Did you have one? Uh, no, I think we're it's just about time for us to wrap up. All right. Well, thank you again, Edward. It was great to have you on the show. If you could stick around for a minute longer, uh, we'll chat just a bit more. But thanks again, everybody. Bye bye.